we're here we are at the Dollar oh, Tree, oh, Mary. That's Very a great good. shot. Yeah. Yeah, so we're what, are we gonna, what are we going to try to find at the Dollar Tree, Doug? Well, this is uh, uh, the task here in front of us is to uh, find the strangest commodity or consumer good mm -hmm. that we can here at the Dollar Store. That the, sounds like a fantastic Is it the Dollar adventure. Tree or the Dollar Store? It's the Dollar Tree. The Dollar Tree. It's so the Tree of Dollars. We shall and pluck the, the most bizarre item, uh, the most bizarre commodity from the Dollar Tree. Oh. It's probably going to be a very large bag of human teeth. What? I found the weirdest thing in the whole dollar store. What is it? In 1899, the Norwegian economist Thorstein Veblen coined the phrase conspicuous consumption in his book, The Theory of the Leisure Class. According to Veblen, the practice of conspicuous consumption, that is, the consumption of useless goods that in no way contribute to productive life, arose out of the patriarchal past. Originally, such consumption was a way to demarcate men from women and was a sign of social prestige, whereas According to Veblen, even at the turn of the 20th century, consumption, as it fell to the women, was merely incidental to their work. It was a means to their continued labor, and not a consumption directed to their own comfort and fullness of life. The difference in social prestige meant that the consumption of certain victuals and beverages were taboo for women. Women were not to smoke or to drink, but were instead to find satisfaction in preparing the meals, drinks, pipes, and slippers for the gentlemen who they were to serve. Veblen was a pragmatist, which meant that, for him, what was objectionable in this arrangement was that it encouraged irrational and unhealthy consumption, and he was saddened that, even as the power of human ingenuity and industriousness expanded, this conspicuous consumption remained and even expanded. The duty to consume was taken up more and more by more and more people. Modern middle-class wives and servants, for instance, had the duty to consume the finest things in order to demonstrate the nobility of their husbands or masters. For Veblen, the duty to consume could be found even, and maybe especially, in the religious institutions of Europe. Veblen observed that, in the middle and upper classes, the women and the servants were the most devout, but he hoped that as urban industries and American pragmatism rose up, secularization would erode the people's devotion to both conspicuous consumption and religion. Forty years later, while writing for the Frankfurt School Journal Studies in Philosophy and Social Science, Theodore Adorno noted how pervasive Veblen's critique had become how his terms and notions had gripped the public's imagination and how they had permeated journalism. While acceptance through recuperation is frequently the fate of social critics, Adorno suggested that Veblen might be less of a critic, less of an outsider than he at first appeared to be. Instead, Adorno cast Veblen as a mostly traditional figure whose ideas fit neatly within what he called the Occidental tradition. What Adorno noted most of all was how Veblen's tract against consumerism was a call for people to adjust to the practical demands of the newly emerging industrial economy. 
What Adorno admired in Veblen's critique, however, were the ways in which the pragmatist railed against the mass culture that was on the horizon. Adorno, too, objected to how, as he put it, individuality was being stamped out in favor of sameness. The brutal fact at the turn of the century was that culture was slowly being transformed into advertising. Literature and art were to be eliminated in favor of propaganda and PR made in the service of domination, and Veblen could see it coming. In the end, according to Adorno, Veblen succumbed to positivism, which meant, as per the introductory essay in the journal, that Veblen had surrendered to the authority of facts in which reason, autonomous and critical reason, is subordinated to the observation of facts. To put this in the parlance of the Bush administration, Veblen was stuck in the reality-based community. Mr. Susskind says in the 1% solution that the ideologues within the current government defer, uh, refer to people not just like me, although I'm included, but even moderate Republicans like Colin Powell and Admiral Scowcroft as somehow lesser political mortals because we are trapped in, quote, the reality-based world. And, and what they mean by that, in fairness to them, what they mean by that is you can use power to change reality. In his upcoming book, A Left for Itself, Zero Books author David Swift attacks the left for its consumeristic impulses and for the way it has become useless. He quotes Brendan Barber, who lamented that the future could end up being divided between those who struggle to muster an interest about anything apart from consumerism and the minutiae of their own lives and those who obsess over a particular issue. The difficulty is that without any vision of socialism, without a name to break with the facts as they are currently framed by the economic system, the left can't develop a universal emancipatory project. But I think that, as we consider the problem of consumerism today, more than a century after Veblen's book, the question is this. Have we reached a point where positivism, where submission to the facts, is a permanent condition? So here we are at Ikea, my favorite place in the world. That's neat. I'm not sure what's your favorite, but... Because it's beautiful. It's like the fantasy of all life. It's like, if you could pandas. live like this... Well, uh, the pandas Live in are, a gigantic store. The pandas are incident. Well, look at the fantasy here. You know, Nora so used sometimes just comes here and, like, hangs out because right. she feels so comfortable here. The philosophy of Ikea. IKEA, as I'm sure you know, is a global lifestyle mega retailer with industrial warehouse stores that stock stylish and standardized products, all of which have comically unpronounceable names, ripe for mockery by self-satisfied American Philistines. The IKEA style falls squarely within the rubric of modernism, or, more precisely, the design philosophy within modernism known as functionalism, with a few nods here and there to more classical design aesthetics such as arts and crafts. This is ironic when you consider that both functionalism and the arts and crafts movement have ideological underpinnings that challenge many of the aspects of capitalism that IKEA itself has come to embody. Functionalism adheres to the principle that, quote, form follows function, a phrase coined by architect Louis Sullivan in 1896. The functionalist design aesthetic emerged after World War I as part of a wave of modernism. At its core was the same humanist desire to create a new and better world that drove the social and political movements in Europe after the war. Buildings, and the furniture in those buildings, were a means to foment a kind of soft revolution, a way to improve the lives of the working class by allowing them broader access to more pleasant, comfortable, efficient surroundings. Functionalism had its most profound impacts in Czechoslovakia, Germany, Poland, the USSR, the Netherlands, Finland, and of course, Sweden, 
birthplace of Ingvar Kamprad, who founded IKEA in 1943 when he was 17, and who, by the time he died in 2018, was one of the 10 richest people in the world with a net worth of $58.7 billion. But for the moment, let's just note that there is a dichotomy inherent in the DNA of functionalism and modernism. Taking a swing through IKEA's more traditional furniture selections, notably the bland, attractive, unthreatening, and not particularly comfortable Hemneys line, one easily detects shades of William Morris, founder of a group of radical artists in the late 19th century who celebrated human craftsmanship and challenged industrialization, mass production, and consumerism. It would be interesting to take Morris on a walk through an Ikea and see what the father of the arts and crafts movement would think of the sleek, practical lines of a Hemneys bedstead delivered in a flat pack cardboard box ready to be built by hand or rather assembled by disposable Allen wrench. The man who once said, quote, the reward of labor is life, is that not enough? Would probably also be horrified to learn of the Ikea effect. IKEA engineers the symbolic representation of idealized consumerism into their sedative, infantilizing shopping experience. A trip through an IKEA store is like walking through a well-planned-out dream, through a vague and hazy fantasy realm of curated lifestyles. At IKEA, you are free to select, but not to choose. You follow a rigidly prescribed path, helpfully lit by directional arrows. Deviating from this path is overtly subversive. I never feel more like an actual anarchist than when I go to the IKEA in Portland and skip the escalator to the second floor and instead take the shortcut through the alarmed emergency doors behind Small Land, the friendly child containment facility common to all IKEA stores, to the first floor where you find all the plates, pillows, lamps, and candles, which are what you really came to IKEA to get in the first place. But you're not supposed to hack your way through the alarmed emergency doors. That is not the narrative you're intended to follow. You're supposed to start on the second floor, where all the Potemkin Village loft apartments are laid out in a neat procession. Like a trip across the river Styx to the afterlife, the second floor of Ikea is Bardo, the liminal period between death and rebirth in the Tibetan Buddhist canon, where one is gradually separated from one's attachments to one's past life, a life full of bills and shitty bosses and even shittier furniture, and spiritually cleared to transcend to the next stage of existence. The next stage of existence, of course, being the first floor, where I already mentioned you find the plates, pillows, lamps, and candles. But to get there requires a journey in which you confront your deepest fantasies and aspirations. Like a near-death experience, you relive every moment of your life on the second floor, from birth to death, not as it was, but as it should have been. The children's toys are on the second floor because those are the toys you were supposed to have had. The glamorous fake loft apartments were the apartments you were supposed to have lived in, with all the sophisticated books you were supposed to have read, and the soft, springy beds you were supposed to have had amazing sex in. And if I haven't mentioned the meatballs yet, though I think I have, they are also on the second floor. All the really good stuff is upstairs, both literally and metaphorically. And then, having seen your life as it should have been, you descend to the underworld and you consume. You fill the comically oversized blue bag in your eco-friendly shopping trolley with as much crap as it can hold, collected willy-nilly from big bins stuffed beyond the point of capacity in a retailing strategy known internally as the Bulla Bulla technique. This technique, wrote Lauren Collins in a 2011 New Yorker article subtitled, quote, Is the IKEA ethos comfy or creepy? is intended to create the impression of volume and therefore inexpensiveness. 
Reassured and emboldened by this abundance, you grab and stuff and wheel. You reify the fantasies of the second floor. You collect the necessary items for your eventual rebirth. You now have something to live up to, a new life to emerge into. You've been cleansed of your past. You're ready for a new future, one that is plush, tidy, organized, Swedish, sleek, acceptable, trendy, hip, urbane, and modern. You are collecting your great reward for the labor you are required to enact every day, for the sacrifices you're required to make, and it feels fucking great. Until you get home, and have to put it all together, that is. While Andy Warhol has come to define pop art in the public imagination, the British collage artist and painter Richard Hamilton founded the movement with a work entitled Just What Is It That Makes Today's Homes So Different, So Appealing? And it was the oversized lollipop held by the 1954 winner of the Mr. Los Angeles contest that provided Hamilton and his followers with the name Pop. Perhaps the easiest way to understand why pop art, a movement that appears to be either ambivalent about consumer society or to outright celebrate it, should start in Britain, is to recall British rationing. The Axis and Allied powers both ran blockades during the Second World War, and the supply of foreign imports to Britain fell from around 55 million tons of food a year before the war to 12 million tons a year during the long battle of the Atlantic. Rationing was introduced in order to make sure that every British citizen received his or her fair share of food and other goods during the war. But the policy wasn't lifted for nearly a decade afterward. It wasn't until the 4th of July in 1954 that the ration ended and British citizens could enjoy meat without worry. They could even buy a burger at the Wimpy Bar, a new American fast food brand that licensed its name to the British J. Lyons & Company that same year. Hamilton's collage appeared shortly after the end of rationing. In 1956, he assembled the interior of his appealing home out of magazine and newspaper clippings his wife had gathered, and he used the small work as a poster for an art exhibition entitled This Is Tomorrow. The exhibit was organized by the Independent Group, or the IG, a group that was influenced by the Surrealist tradition, but also by futurism, advertising, cybernetics, and American sociologists like David Reisman, who in his 1950 book, The Lonely Crowd, argued that the new American personality was other-directed, quite accommodating, and ultimately conformist. Reisman, in turn, was influenced by Eric Fromm. Unlike the pop artists, Fromm was not ambivalent about consumerism, and in 1976, he would publish a rather straightforward critique of consumer society entitled To Have or To Be. In it, he wrote that the great promise of the Industrial Revolution had failed, that it had been destined to fail, for three reasons. The first reason being the internal contradictions built into the social relations that constituted the economy that had brought the Industrial Revolution into existence but he put aside this in favor of focusing on the other two, both of which he described as psychological. The problems were that industrialism aimed at happiness rather than meaning, and it generated egotism and selfishness in the population. Fromm argued that, instead of having possessions, instead of the satisfaction of owning luxury goods or consuming mass-produced treats, we should instead aim at being as it was described in the Old Testament and by mystics such as Meister Eckhart. The problem here, at least for me, is whether or not the pop artists, whether the quintessential pop artist Andy Warhol, for example, could be said to have opted for having or for being. Eckhart advocated for spiritual poverty. He wrote, we have sometimes said that man ought to live as if he did not live, neither for self 
nor for the truth, nor for God. To live as if you don't live. Isn't that what Andy Warhol tried to do? Isn't that what he was driving at when he said that his greatest desire was the desire to be a machine? And wasn't it what he meant when he said, the most beautiful thing in Tokyo is McDonald's. The most beautiful thing in Stockholm is McDonald's. The most beautiful thing in Florence is McDonald's. Peking and Moscow don't have anything beautiful yet. Looking good. Of course, today, Beijing and Moscow do have McDonald's. There's been a McDonald's in China for 27 years and a McDonald's in Moscow for nearly 30. There was a reason that pop art both criticized and celebrated post-war American consumerism. And it seems to me that the choice today isn't between having and being, but between being and becoming. This means accepting that what we are isn't fixed, and that the apparent abundance of what is is less of an obstacle to what we could be than German submarines and ration booklets were or would be. The truth is, we will have to find revolutionaries at McDonald's, or if not there, then at Burger King. Uh, my name is Andy Warhol, and uh, I just finished eating uh, a hamburger. a commodity is what serves as a link between subjects, what allows us to live in a society, to be together. But because in this way social relationships are always ambiguous, at least partly hidden, my own subjective experience is also divided. It only seems natural. My thoughts divide as much as they unite. My words unite by what they express and isolate or fracture apart by what they omit. A gulf opens up between my inner sense certainty my understanding of myself for myself and the seemingly objective truth of what I am for others. Because of this, I always end up guilty, even though I feel innocent. Worst of all, every object or commodity I use to communicate, every act of consumption especially, produces a sense of isolated guilt. I'm alone because I can't escape the objective fact of this world of commodities. I can't communicate or even understand myself. But perhaps I can let go of the guilt. I can't know myself alone, in myself. But I can still look to others. Reach out to people. And simulate talk and thought. Today, when reactionary movements appear to be on the rise, revolution appears to be impossible. A new world war seems to threaten an appearance. Liberal capitalism seems unsure of itself. When scientific progress is a digital mirage, and the future seems to disappear. Where can we start if we want to connect? What do we want to start? This Starbucks coffee is a symptom of the world gone wrong, and I could refuse to participate. I could smash the windows of this Starbucks with a brick. I could throw this coffee to the floor. To do this would be to accept that all that there is left is impotent resistance. If the commodity form really is the current social limit, the determining factor, and if it doesn't matter whether I drink this coffee or not, because my money has already gone on to set up its reproduction. All money goes on in circulation to set up its own reproduction and expansion. Then guilt isn't helpful. Neither is going without caffeine. To sit with a cup of coffee and think things through. To enjoy, as Hemingway put it, a clean, well-lit place. Doesn't necessarily mean accepting this place, this moment, as static or frozen. This too could pass away. And something new. Some new form could take hold of society and the world. 
but this will only happen if I let go of guilt. If I get beyond the problem or contradiction in Starbucks and realize what this experience at a cafe is simulating, what promise is being made by the mermaid logo, what dream can be conjured within a corporate cafe. A cup of coffee, well brewed, a conversation worked through and enjoyed. Everything will follow from there. Where else could it start but at a Starbucks? All right, Noah, what do you got there? I got my laser pistol from the year 1999. And I got my Garfield lunchbox. And I got my damn hat. Yeah, is that your damn hat? That's my damn hat. Because that's what it says. Yes, that's it. It is what it says. That's why I said it. Yes. This is my. This, this is your my damn, damn hat. hat. Yeah, this is my damn. So hat. okay, let's put all this stuff back now. No, but I, I, I promised him I'd buy it. Who, who's that? In 1938, the Frankfurt School philosopher Theodore Adorno published an essay on modern music entitled "On the Fetish Character in Music and the Regression in Music." In it. He explained how it was that the popular music of the 30s helped to reinforce capitalist relations and shut off both listening and thinking. What did, what did she blind you with, Noah? TV. Look she at blinded this. me with science. Enjoying music in the 30s did not require involvement and assessment through engaged listening and evaluation, but rather that what would be received as good music was determined in advance by PR men, publishing houses, radio stations, and the rest of the culture industry. Adorno wrote that in modern music, everything has value only in so far as it can be exchanged, not in so far as it is something in itself. For consumers, the use value of art, its essence, is a fetish, and the fetish the social valuation, which they mistake for the merit of works of art, becomes its only use value, the only quality they enjoy. For modern listeners, then, Adorno wrote, it no longer makes any difference whether we are consuming Beethoven's Seventh Symphony or a bikini. The same principle of the fetish is at work in the experience of both. Adorno's work in On the Fetish Nature of Music and in his culture industry essay, Star Wars and so on. Hi, Chewie. Takes up Marx's notion of commodity fetishism and applies it to cultural products. But in order to evaluate Adorno's theory of fetish, we should establish just what Marx was driving at when he wrote on the subject. For Marx, the commodity took on a fetish character not because the use values in various commodities were taken to be of no interest to the consumers who purchased them. A widget produced in a widget factory became a fetish due to the character of the human labor that determined its abstract value in relation to other commodities. It was the alienated and abstract character of that labor that led Marx to speak of the commodity as a fetish. In Capital, Marx wrote, As a general rule, articles of utility become commodities only because they are products of the labor of private individuals or groups of individuals who carry on their work independently of each other. The sum total of the labor of all these private individuals forms the aggregate labor of society. Since the producers do not come into social contact with each other until they exchange their products, the specific social character of each producer's labor does not show itself except in the act of exchange. In other words, the labor of the individual asserts itself as a part of the labor of society only by means of the relations which the act of exchange establishes directly between the products and indirectly through them between the producers. To the latter, therefore, the relations connecting the labor of one individual with that of the rest appear not as direct social relations between individuals at work, but as what they really are, material relations between people, and social relations between things. How it could be that Adorno, who was by all accounts a more than competent reader of Marx, could have conflated 
the sort of fetish that Freud talks about. That is, that he could conceive of the fetish in, despite his protestations to the contrary, psychological terms. It can't be explained by examining Adorno in isolation, but instead has to be understood as a product of the Frankfurt School in its totality and really as a product of the development of the left. We should ask how it came to be that the Marxist left itself abandoned Marx's understanding of the commodity and of capitalism and instead came to believe that, as Moish Baston would put it in his book Time, Labor, and Social Domination, that the state, whether the Soviet state or FDR's America, had overcome or transcended the economic sphere. How did the left come to believe that economics had been superseded by the political realm? I suspect that Stalin's version of communism infected even his most ardent critics, but I don't have time to examine the full story of the development of what Postone Stone called traditional Marxism now. Instead, I'll just comment on what I think the consequence of returning to a Marxism that takes his critique of political economy seriously, what believing that capitalism as Marx understood it continues today would mean for critics of consumerism. It would mean that far from being totally dominated by any ideologically homogenous culture industry, today's consumers are controlled within a marketplace of ideas that are distorted and riven with the same contradictions that sets our capitalist society off towards perpetual crisis. It means that rather than pessimistically judging every television program, every pop song, every leftover bit of kibble that we might find in a vintage store as a tool of an establishment that reduces us all to one dimension, instead of believing that we can't even think past capitalism, we should instead believe that the culture that occupies us and directs our lives also presents us with opportunities to transcend it. Melvin Underground and Nico. It's good stuff. Right. This is this is top-notch consumer culture right here. Top-notch, high-grade consumer culture. High octane. Mm -hmm. mm. I want to talk about how this video has become your defense of capitalism. This, this video has not become a, a, a defense of capitalism. Well, okay. This video has become a defense of consumerism, mm. um, which is the market side or the side of, in, of circulation in a capitalist society. Okay. It's the one good part. If you have money, it's a good part. Well, Even if you have just a little bit of money, it's a per it's a pretty good part because in a society where mass production prevails, you know the commodities are cheap. Things that we talked about last time we tried to film this was um, what our favorite commercials were. Uh -huh. Because I, I thought it was a good idea to have your favorite commercial to accept that the system of private enterprise and capitalism actually has to produce visions of something that will transcend it and just to sell itself. Like, in order to sell a product effectively, you have to bring a little bit of utopianism into your marketing campaign. My favorite commercial is, that's a sum of spicy meatball. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, that was very utopian. <laughs> My favorite commercial. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what was that a commercial it was for. for it was like Pepto Bismol, Alka Seltzer. He he been a, he was an actor and he was making a commercial and they made him eat all these meatballs and every time he had to say that's so a spicy meatball and then every then he ate so many meatballs it gave him indigestion and so then he had Alka Seltzer. And that was the story. Well, but your favorite ad, you're just you're just a fucking troll. <laughs> you're just a troll. <laughs> My favorite, you know what my favorite ad was? What's your favorite ad, Doug? Do you know? Do you know what it is? Can the you remember? Apple, the, Apple, the Apple computer one. No, but that's a good oh, one. Oh, no, no, it was the, I want to teach the world to sing. The Coca-Cola, it's, it's like 1970, 71. It's the Seekers, is in the name of the band that made the song. It was actually originally written for the ad, and then they put it on an album and released it as a single. They without did? the without the Coca-Cola. Oh. Without the Coca-Cola bit. Yeah, it wasn't the other way around. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure... And, um, you know, it was featured in the last episode of Mad Men. And it's the most probably utopian ad in history that I know of. Just by having to create a vision of world peace or having to create a vision of 
liberation in order to sell a soda mm -hmm. means that you're keeping that idea in the culture. It can't be gotten rid of. It's here. It's it's that that notion is a part of the culture we're in. And mm -hmm. if maybe comes to us uh, as a lie, but I think it was Keita Borders said, you know, in a society where the world's been turned upside down like ours, then the truth comes to you in the form of a lie. Did he say it in like a movie voice? In a he society, says, in a society where, where the, the world's world. been turned upside down, <laughs> the truth comes to you in the form of a lie. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and so white turtle doves. I'd like to teach the world to sing, sing with me. Thanks for watching this Zero Books video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to this channel and click on the notifications bell so that you'll be alerted whenever we release a new video. You should also consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons get access to our Inside Zero Books podcast every week and can get access to the Zero Books book club and help us to continue making online content from the left.